Hi, Dave. Hi. Hello, Jean. How are you? I'm good on you. Good. Good. Thanks for doing this so late here. Appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Still, still walking on crutches, though. Oh, you are? Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, how yeah, did it all go? Yeah, I broke yeah. my in August, and then it's, uh, yeah, it's taking a long time to heal. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, you're able to find some alternative uh, activities with the ankle? Well, that's the problem, you know. I, I don't know. No, <laughs> I got a bike, you know, that uh, you go with your hands. Mm-hmm. So I've been doing this a little bit, but uh, I usually play tennis and squash, you know, so like the racket sport. So <laughs> yeah, those are tough with a broken ankle, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no way around it. Yeah. And you said you've been traveling some when I spoke to you last as well. Uh, yeah. No, I, not, not very much during COVID. No, but doing a lot of things like this, though. Mm -hmm. Great. I have some something tomorrow morning at eight o'clock with uh, in Colombia. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, so I kind of, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully things will open up soon. How is it there? You know, medium. I would say. You know, we've we've done well. I think uh, overall, um, things are going in the right direction. Certainly, um, we do have some snow in the way. It looks like next week, so uh, we will. Have a little bit of natural snow maybe and probably start making some snow here at our okay. little ski hill in town here as well when does it start like cross country uh well you know up, up higher there's a little area outside of town um that's higher elevation it's about um 2700 meters where you can typically start uh, by november 1st at the latest will be there sometime sooner sometimes okay. middle of october yeah. And then um, down in town, natural snow is more end of November, early December. But then, then the Alpine resorts open up uh, right at right at Thanksgiving, essentially. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Would not you, so far uh, away. Do, do you know uh, any Canadian coaches or? I do. I know some of the the cross the ski to fawn, the cross country guys a little yeah, bit. So, um, do you yeah. Know Alain Parent? Yeah, I know. I mean, I remember him. You know, we crossed paths certainly. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? okay. When we were, he's yeah. a very good friend of mine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we went to school together. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. No. We... Um, la a couple of years ago, I went to uh, Canmore, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I gave a, I gave a workshop and talked to some people. I'm trying to remember the name of the person who invited me from. He's, he's, he lives in Montreal. Like north of Montreal, uh, shoot, what's his name? Very, very outgoing guy. Yes, uh, I, I know here. Did he? I think he lived in Norway for some time, uh, yeah. maybe or no. I'm, there's, there's the guys from the Canadians, the, the um, Quebec City Center. Okay. Um, and then there's a, you know, a big group out in Canmore of coaches. Oh, yeah, I'm trying, yeah, yeah. I'm trying yeah. to think which one it might be. Oh. Um, yeah, the, uh, we would cross paths. There's, for, I, I cross country raced for many years, so we would spend a lot of time. In, I'm from Vermont originally as well, so we'd oh, spend okay. a lot of time in Canada racing out west in BC and Alberta at Canmore, but also up at Mont Saint Anne, frequently yes. up in Quebec City. So um, I we had to go north to get the snow, and it was a great great skiing culture too. So oh, nice. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm originally from Drummondville. Oh, cool. of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah Very yeah. close. So you're almost, almost in Vermont there. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so should I try to share my screen? Uh, yeah, maybe just to make sure I, it should be fine. I've done a number of these recently. I just, uh, okay. just always better to check than not. So, so I got a few. Uh, yeah, maybe you can tell me which one you see. Do you see... Uh, I see developing interest and in skill in athletes. Okay, um, the, the big, the big one, because I've got the presenter view. So on my, because I got two screen. <laughs> let me just um, make sure it's going to go big here. One second. Yeah, I think you could go bigger if you could uh, do presenter view uh, from here. It's quite big, but I think you could do it. Uh, We're seeing some of the participants. Do you see two slides or one slide? One slide. 
I don't think I can make this. Slide. Okay, then then we're good. Then we're good. It might just okay. be my my uh, home computer here. As uh, we see some oh, folks okay. on the side too. Yeah, because yeah, it's filling my screen right now. Uh, I got two. I have two videos at the beginning. Can I just try try that? So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, Esquire Network presents a sneak peek of Friday Night Tykes. You have yeah. That works. That works. Okay. Okay. Have you ever watched that show? Or? I haven't. No. Okay. I'm not, a, but I'm not the person to ask probably on that. No, I never watched it either. I found this on the internet, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty scary. Uh, oh yeah. That's a, that'll be a little different. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, being on top of things for next week, because I, I kind of forgot that I needed to give you the workbook and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look through the workbook. It looks looks great, Jean. So I look forward to that. I <clears throat> we will do that in person. Um, okay. you know, we'll be able to be be have a small group together for that. That'll be fine. So good. I, I, I think if you want to uh, serve as a little bit like a, well, if you want to lead the group there, like facilitate mm -hmm. the group there, because I may put people into different tables. Are they gonna be at tables or in a row or yeah, we can do tables. I think will be the most. We can probably do a semicircle, so you can probably even see most of us from. Okay. Uh, if I set the if I set the uh, computer up right, we'll probably be able to see us. But it's certainly one of us, and I can help moderate that definitely. Okay, and then and then if there was uh, smaller groups, like maybe maybe two or three times, I'll ask people to discuss within their group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, can just, they can just report or. Yep, I can do that. Sounds good. I was looking at your website. You have a, that's a big club you have there. Yeah, we have quite a bit going on. I hope it. Uh, I hope we meet the uh, sports sampling uh, recommendations you make. Uh, I yeah. think so. Yeah. So a lot of the, most of the kids do other sports also outside the clubs. You know, they play soccer and okay. lacrosse okay. and um, mountain biking in the summer, which we do as well. But yeah, it's a uh, Okay. Definitely on the snow, we definitely have it. We have it pretty well covered. Biathlon would be the one I think one only big one that we're missing right uh, now. Yeah, interesting. Huh. Do, do you make snow there? I remember in Canmore they were making snow. Uh, that, uh, not, what did they call that? Uh, a snow farm? They were farming. We don't store it. No, yeah. it's okay. it, it's um it's a little bit too warm here. And the, I mean, it could be done maybe, you know, but the summers are quite warm here still, you know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, normally 27 C, you know, uh, plus that in the summer highs. So you'd have to get it completely out of the sun and uh, really, uh, really insulated. I think Canmore, they get those cold nights in the summer all the way through and have a good place. So, yeah, we'd like to do that. We just, but we do have good snowmaking conditions. Okay. Um, early season through the winter, we have, you know, very cold nights, um, and it, our location in, right in steamboat where most of our programs kind of base, especially the younger kids is it's, um, right in the town, but we can make snow. We'll be making snow next week there. So, oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Well, Not quite as early as, uh, Camor though. Yeah. No, I was just, I never saw that before the, 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 the you know, keeping this, like they had a, they just have a big hole. They put this in <clears> yeah. The uh, kind of wood chip on top yeah yeah there are maybe three or four places in scandinavia that do that okay and they can push it out and then do a three or five kilometer course you know okay. um 30 centimeters deep um in october and start skiing so it's uh they do it in quebec city too i think okay i yeah. don't know if it's Saint yeah. Anne, but, uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so is the town where you are? Is is it Steamboat or is it? It is. Yep. The town mm -hmm. is also, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the resort is also called Steamboat. Okay. Um, so the town is about uh, 12, 13,000 people, and then maybe I think twenty thousand people in our kind of valley here. So, so yeah. not a not a huge community, but one that's very, very uh, passionate about snow sports, certainly. So we have, I think you might, may have seen on the website, but I'll brag anyway. So we have almost a hundred Olympians, winter Olympians from the, wow. from the wow. Valley over the years. So. Wow. That's, that's great. Huh. 
So for folks joining on here, it's almost 6.30. I'll wait until a couple minutes after 6.30 before we start, um, just to give people time to, to get settled. Thanks for everyone for joining around dinner time here. I appreciate it. No, it's, uh, it's tough to find the best time with training and work and everything. So this is what worked. So uh, next Wednesday, we start at two, huh? We'll st at two Eastern, yes. I think, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. And John, I'll do a quick introduction just to start, just to get you ready. And I'll, um, I think I'll let people, <clears throat> just let people know to, that we'll have a question and answer at the end, just so that you can keep going. And if people wanna put questions in the chat, I can help to moderate those and maybe present those at, um, when you're done as well. Perfect. I'm happy to stop uh, every 10 or 15 minutes to take question too, if things are, sometimes it's hard to stay on, you know, for, for a long time. So we can have a regular break of, of three or four minutes and just get some questions if, if people. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. would that would work well too, I think. Yeah, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to remember a question for quite that long too, so. Yeah, okay. sometime online. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it doesn't look like well at this point there's not that many people, huh? so. No, I think we'll have some people just tend to filter on. Okay. A bit here. Okay. I don't mind if people have their camera on. Maybe there's reason why they don't. But uh... <laughs> maybe they're eating dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I think um, just out of interest, everyone's time for those who are on now. I think we'll have some people joining on, but I think I will get started. Jean, if you're ready to go here, those yeah. people, those people uh, show their faces here. Um, uh, for those of you who, who I don't know, I'm Dave Stewart, I'm Athletic Director with the Winter Sports Club, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jean Cote here tonight. He's one of the world's foremost researchers in the area of long-term athlete development and expertise, and his work has been cited tens of thousands of times over the last 20, 30 years of his research. Dr. Cote is a professor and director in the School of Kinesiology and Health Studies at Queen's University at Kingston in Canada. His research interests are in the areas of youth sport, coaching, sports expertise 
and positive youth development. He is regularly invited to present his work, both sport governing organizations and academic conferences throughout the world. Dr. Cody's research has informed the Winter Sports Club's philosophy, as well as the most recent U.S. Ski and Snowboard long-term athlete development model. I'm really interested in the development practices, which simultaneously foster elite performance, long-term participation, and personal development, and consider the important questions of sports sampling, specialization, and the role of parents. And this is something that uh, Dr. Cody has focused on for many years. Uh, Dr. Cody's presentation tonight will focus on recent research on the personal as asset framework, which examines dynamics between sport participation, appropriate settings, quality social dynamics, and personal engagement to foster sport participation, personal development, and long-term performance. A uh, big thank you to Dr. Cody for presenting to the Word Sports Club tonight and fitting this in on the late side of his side. He's on the Eastern time zone tonight, so he's coming a little bit, uh, quite a bit longer after dinner than for us. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Cody, for fitting us in. I know you have a busy schedule between uh, your teaching and research work and present presentations like this. We really appreciate it. Um, and the structure tonight, uh, I believe Dr. Cody's presentation will be around 60 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Cody will just stop periodically if there are some questions uh, to give people an opportunity to ask those as well as we go along. So uh, without more time of me talking, uh, Dr. Cote, I'll let you start. All right. Well, th thanks. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dave, Dave, for the introduction, and, and I'm very happy to be here. I think I'm, I'm just going to share my screen right now. Um, oops. Okay. Just want to get the te technology working first. Uh, yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, yeah. Th thank you very much. I'm. I'm. Uh, honor and, and happy to, to present uh, some of the work that we've been doing for the last, uh, well, I, I, think, I think what you're going to see tonight is probably like the last 30 years. It's really, really trying to get all the research uh, into something that we can understand and something that uh, can be translated and used by coaches and parents. Uh, so I, I, I think the last thing I want to do is to board you at 6.30 for you at night. And I, so I'm going to try to make this as uh, exciting as possible, uh, as we as excited as we can be on Zoom. Uh, that's not the that's not the most. Uh, but uh, but I, I yeah. So so I think like Dave said, I'm I'm gonna stop regularly, maybe every ten or fifteen minutes to see if there's any uh, reaction or questions or insight. Uh, uh, Okay, so I'm gonna start. I, 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 the title I put to this talk is Developing Interest and Skill in Athletes. And I think it's kind of the two, two things that we want to achieve in any kind of clubs and as a coach. You want to make sure that your athletes are having fun, they stay engaged, they're committed to what they're doing, and you also want to develop skill. Uh, and sometimes these two things could be incompatible. They could be like a fun practice may not be the best practice for skill acquisition. So really what I want to look at here is athlete development. So we're going to look at uh, a range of age uh, and what we should be doing. What are some of the things that we know from the research that are important at different stages of an athlete development? So I just wanted to start with two, two short video uh, that show two different perspectives on uh, on coaching and on athlete development. And, and they're, not, they're not winter sport. Well, the, the second one is, is ice hockey. Uh, but the first one is, uh, is, is football. And you may have seen this before. This is, uh, this is a show that's uh, kind of uh, a squire network on uh, Friday night types. Uh, oh, and, and the video has been kind of go viral, but I just want to show it to show you one perspective of, of youth sport. Esquire Network presents a sneak peek of Friday Night Tykes. You have the opportunity today to rip their freaking head off and let them bleed. If I cut them with a knife, they're going to bleed red just like you. You go out there like Junior Broncos, you play Junior Bronco football, and you can do it. If you believe in yourself, you can do whatever it is you want to do in life. Do it now, though. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Do it now. One, two, three. This is the Texas Youth Football Association, one of the elite football leagues for kids in America. 
and the eight and nine year old rookie division in San Antonio features the best of the best. Hey, give me that soft crap. There should be no reason why y'all don't make other teams cry. I could care less if they cry. The teams are ultra competitive. Demanding commitment. This is where you earn your playtime. Sacrifice. Pets. You can do this. You're stronger than this. Five teams. We come out screaming and yelling. Yeah. Five heated rivals. Oh, we got to fight. We got to fight. Only one can win. You're so worried about winning that you're not playing. I don't care how much pain you're in. You don't quit. You, know, you guys forget that they are babies. If yeah, that kid comes across, I want you to put it in his helmet. You understand? Yes, sir. I don't care if you don't get up. Let's go. Friday Night Tykes premieres January 14th at 9 on the new Esquire Network. Okay, so that's one, one way, uh, and I'm sure that's not happening in, happen, this is not happening at Steamboat, uh, but that's one way of looking at, at uh, youth sport. Uh, so eight and nine years old uh, football players. Here's another perspective. So this is a, a child. Uh, this is ice hockey. So what exactly goes through the minds of kids in the middle of a sporting event? Well, the father of a young hockey player wanted to find out. So he mic'd up his four-year-old son, Mason, before practice on the ice, and he got an earful. So, two perspective of youth sport. Uh, you know, the adult, the adult uh, running the running the show with the football, and and I think a kid's just having fun doing sport. And I know the, there's a lot of issues with the two videos; they're very short. Uh, and you know, we're comparing eight and nine year old with four years old. But but I think. The reason I wanted to show you this is just to raise some questions and to start making you think about how we design sport programs for kids and what's important. And, and I guess there's two questions I, I'd like to kind of you to reflect on. And, and I'm happy if, if, if anybody wants to write in the chat or, or, or voice uh, so, some insight here. But you know, how do we reconcile these two perspectives of development to sport? Uh, you know, obviously Texas, I think, is, 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 is developing a lot of football players in the NFL. Uh, so, so, is that, so is that a system that works? Is it, does it work what, they, what they're doing there? Uh, and then, uh, you know, the second question is, what are the elements that explain these two different perspectives? And the two different perspective here to me is adult-led, kind of adult-imposed types of training, versus the kids, why are they in sport? You know, that little kids on the ice was just there to experience, explore things, explore different ways of doing things. And so anybody wants to give a few insights of why, how we can explain those two different perspectives? And it's okay, I know it's not an easy thing to do on Zoom. I think they can focus, uh, represent a focus on, on winning versus the experience, the outcome versus the experience, perhaps. Definitely. So, so and, and probably the football program had a very long term outcome, huh? like in terms of well, long term outcomes. They wanted to produce players, professional players, probably, while the other one is just get on the ice and have fun. And yeah, it's a good point. Anything else you can think like big picture things here or, or, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I think I think it also has to do with you know the the Texas parents living vicariously through their seven year old children, right? Like these are the guys that you know weren't successful football players themselves, but now they're they're going to do everything possible to make their kids be successful so that they can be you know yes. proud of their children for their success, which is you know questionable. Yes, that's a great point. 
versus like you said, the hockey player is just trying to have some fun. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, so I think this is giving me a very nice way of moving on to, so when we think about athlete development, we're thinking about a long pathway, but that during that long trajectory towards, you know, towards recreational sport or towards elite level sport, uh, there's a lot of different stages and there's a lot of different things that should happen at those different stages. And, and I think what's important to realize and, and what I would like to do tonight is, is there's a lot of complexity in all this, but that complexity could be very simple too. Like we could simplify it quite a bit. And, and, and I think when we think the two points that were made, you know, the, the point that, that, that was made about winning versus having fun, and Texas, you know, the culture, they're very different points, but, but, but the thing that we need to understand when we're talking about sport is that we cannot target only one thing to explain success or to explain dropout or engagement over time. And it's very important to think about sport as a system, a system of a lot of different variables affecting what's going on in a practice or in a club or, 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 or in the head of an athlete. And, and I think what, I, you know, what I'd like to really emphasize, emphasize tonight is that the interaction of those systems is what determine the impact that sport have on the immediate, the, the immediate experience of the kids, the short term and the long term. And, and I think it's really important to understand that if we're not able to produce positive experiences in a training with young kids that are starting, there's a lot of chance that we may lose those kids and we may lose those people. So the complexity here is, is very uh, concrete. Uh, when, when we think about sport, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, like football in Texas is probably very different from football in Colorado. And, and uh, you know, so, so when, when you were thinking about that, so that's the big picture, that's the very big environment. Uh, so, so really what I would like to do tonight is take this idea of a developmental system. Uh, Steamboat is a club in a place uh, and then there's coaches and there's athletes and then there, but that's that all that culture is 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 impacting athletes on a field and coaches when they're coaching. So trying to uh, trying to understand how these different uh, system work together, uh, but also to use the dynamic elements. And I, I'm going to reduce sport to a very simple thing: is sport is what you do with who and where. That's, that's, that, that's a very simple way of understanding sport. Like, like you have to do something. There's a training, there's a game, there's a, there's a competition. Uh, so that's what, and then you're doing it with other people. And then you, 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 you need to do something in, there's a physical environment where you're doing it. So we're gonna use that as lenses. And then we're gonna look at the different resolution that we can have to determine this, this type of involvement. And then really what I would like to give you is some building blocks, some very concrete things that we can have from that research. So what I'm going to do all night, or not all night, but the next 40 minutes or 45 minutes to is I'm going to move from complex stuff to very, very simple. Very, so, so hopefully I'm going to give you some very concrete guidelines. But if you take away those messages, there's a lot of complexity to it that you can, and, and, and I think it's gonna to come together as, as, as I keep talking here. But, but again, understanding that I'm gonna go from research to uh, guidelines. So this is the personal assets framework. And that's not very, there's a lot of little boxes here, but it's very, very simple to understand. And, and basically, if we start with this, is that we're, we're thinking about the long-term outcomes of sport as the three Ps. So you want to develop long-term engagement. You want to have athletes that will do cross-country skiing when they're adults. But you also want to send an Olympic uh, uh, skier at, uh, or develop an Olympic skier uh, or an international level skier. 
So that so that's the part the participation and the performance. So these two things are kind of again they don't have to conflict with each other. Programs can produce both. And then the third P is personal development. So the idea is that sport, and we know this from psychology, it's such an important thing. Sport is one of the best activities for kids to develop their assets, to develop things like leadership and discipline and, and uh, initiative. So we know that, we know that from the research, but we don't necessarily, sport is neutral by itself, but it has all the elements to develop those, those per personal assets. So those are the three long-term objectives. Then I'll talk a little bit about in a single season, what do you want to achieve? So I'll talk about the, the, the importance of competence, confidence, connection, and character. And then within a, and then we're reducing. So I'm just going from right to left here. So multiple seasons, single season, you want to develop the four C's. And then every practice, every competition you're going to, you want your, the kids, you want your athletes to have immediate sport experiences that are interesting and that are fun. That, will, that keep them motivated, that keep them going. And then at the left side of this, those are the variables we have. Those are the things we can do as coaches, as parents. Those are the things we can intervene to make the environment better, to make the sport experience better. So what, what these are is that sport is something that you do. So that's an activity in a specific play, place. So for you, it's in steamboat in a club, in a specific club, and at a certain moment in time, and you're doing it with other people. So those are the things that I'm really going to spend a lot of time next to try to, what do we know about this from the research that gives us, that is correlated or that is associated with immediate positive sport experiences, development, the development of assets, and the long-term outcomes of participation, personal development, and performance. So long term, so uh, just summarizing here the three P. So I'm starting on the right again. Long term development, we want performance. Sorry, I took this from a rowing, uh, but th the development of, of, of skills, improving physical health and continued participation, and contribute to positive youth development. So the performance is developing those athletes, those, those elite level athletes, continued engagement, and personal development. The short-term outcome are the four C's, and these come from developmental psychology, and they're they're not necessarily associated with sport, but and they're but but they're a really nice way to represent what a coach should be trying to accomplish within a year. So learning here it would be winter sport specific skill and capabilities, competing and performing. So that's the competence. So every coach, every program, you want to develop better athletes. So that's kind of a given, and that's very often that's what we focus on. The confidence, connection, and character is focusing on those psychosocial development. So confidence, and, and I think there's a lot of you, or it looks like there's a lot of you that have competed at a high level or develop athletes at a high level. And, and Athletes that are very competent don't, don't have the confidence, very often are not able to, to reach or, or perform at the right time. So confidence, connection with other, positive bounds with people and institution, relationship, relationship with parents, coaches, co uh, assistant coaches, opponents. And then finally, character. So, so any club, any team, any coaches should be able to teach sport where athletes respect the rules. They know how to win, they know how to lose. Uh, they play with integrity and they, were, they, they show some compassion for others and there. So again, those are the values, but these are the short-term outcomes. And to me, the four C's have been working really, really, really well when we talk to coaches because they're very easy to remember. And we did studies trying to measure these things over a season. But to me, that would be if you are an effective coach, at the end of this, at the beginning of a season, I measure competence, confidence, connection, and character in your athletes. And I measure that at the end. If you're an effective coach, there should be an increase. There should be an increase of competence, an increase of confidence, an increase of connection, and an increase of character. So if I see that I did my job as a coach, I did my job as a club, I see improvement in my athletes. 
and not only at the level of the skill, but also improvement in their assets. So, and then the immediate sport experience, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but that is what we need to, very often we, we forget that. You know, you, you have an athlete and you want to bring them to the Olympic in 10 years and that's fine. But what is going on with that athletes at a very, you know, within a practice, like, like a practice in January or February where it's cold and, and, and they don't want to be there or like, what do you do as a coach to make sure that they're coming, they're having fun and they're interested. And there's a lot of work that has been done on, on interest. And again, I don't want to spend too much time here, but there's lots we can talk about, but usually interests develop. It starts with the environment. It's, it started with cre being creative. Some, you, you need to get somebody's attention. So think about anything you're doing by interest. I don't know if some of you like music or like wine or beer or, or food or, or reading certain types of book or movies. But usually it starts with a trigger by the environment. There's something that has happened in your life. And then you keep that interest. But what's really important here is to move athletes from situational interest to individual interest, where interest is internal, internalized. And, and athletes now want to re-engage in those more difficult type of training or things that are not bringing immediate gratification. But I think what's really important in terms of this work is to really to make sure that you know where athletes are located in that continuum of interest. And, and if you, they're just starting, or if you see a little bit of uh, uh, interest uh, diminishing a little bit, you need to kind of come up with some interesting stuff you're gonna do, some creative things you're gonna do, some surprising things, some novelty in your training, in your, that will, that will kind of trigger that situational interest again and move them on to, uh, and then get them to really uh, engage. So I'm gonna stop here for a couple of minutes, uh, but, but what basically what I explain here is the, the, the the different timeline of, of outcomes we want to achieve. And to me, coaching, we should not even think about the three Ps. Really what coaching is about, it's about this. It's about developing competence, confidence, connection, and character in all your athletes over a season and focusing on those experiences that will trigger and maintain interest. So if you do this season after season, after season and after season, that's gonna happen. The three P will happen. So any questions or at this point? So what, what, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna talk about the dynamic elements. I'm gonna talk about those three elements here, the three gears that are interacting together. And what do we know from the research on those three gears that develop interests, personal assets, and long-term outcomes. Any questions or? Is it all clear for everybody? Keep going? Okay. So the dynamic elements. So those are the three gears. Uh, on the left side of the model. Uh, and I explained them a little bit. I'm not going to spend much time, but you know, you, you, what, 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 what sport is about is that it's done somewhere. So for you guys, it's, it, 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 it's steamboat. It's a club in a specific place. Uh, and then, and then there's, 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 a, there's, there's different race that you go to. There's different competition that you go to. And then within your club, it's structured in a certain way. There's a competitive level. So there's a grouping of age together. And then, but all these decisions that you're making at the club level affects coaching and affects development. And I know that sometimes we cannot, you know, from a coach perspective, you cannot change that. But you, you, you can change that, I guess, from a club perspective. So how, do you group, how many athletes do you have with, with a coach? You know, just that ratio could affect a lot the experience of the athletes. So, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the physical and competitive structure. The second one is personal engagement and activities. 
So it's what you do. So, so now think about just as a coach within a training or for parents that are that are on the call tonight you're bringing your kids to to a specific to a game or a competition so this is the actual thing that they're going to do so sport you have to do something because it would not be called sport so 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 you train you you race you 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 race with others you race by yourself you but you do these things so that's the activity and then those activities are done there's relationship involved in that. So sometimes there's opponents, there's teammates, there's coaches, there's assistant coaches. Uh, so everything, when we think about sport, it takes place within a social dynamics. And then all that changes over time. So you think about a five-year-old or a six-year-old that are starting with uh, alpine skiing. Uh, so that would be, it's gonna be very different from a 14-year-old in terms of social dynamics, the setting, and then all these things. So this is where it becomes quite complex in terms of what sport is about. So, so in a simple way here is that sport is what you do with who and where. That's it. Okay. So I'm doing how I'm doing downhill skiing at Steamboat on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday afternoon, and I have a training with my coach. So that's so so it's it's at Steamboat. I'm, I, it's a training. We're going to do, I don't know too much about downhill skiing, but we're going to do certain drills. We're going to have a race at the end. And then we, we're going to have seven or eight different athletes or 10 athletes together. So that's, but now thinking about this, there's layers within this. So, so what I just described is the playing field, the race, the mountain you're at. It is alpine skiing. And it is a relationship with your teammates and that training and with your coach. So that creates an experience. But that experience is within Steamboat. So that's the club and organization, and that affects the playing field. It affects the, you know, where, you, where you're doing it. And that's the same thing in terms of the kids. They're doing their sport. They're, they're, in, they're a downhill skier, but may, they're probably doing other combat complementary physical activities. So on Tuesday afternoon, they come, maybe they come from school and they just played, uh, I don't know, they just skated in school or they just did a physical education or they just, so they're tired or they just finished an exam or, or well, exam is not a good one because it has to be a physical activity here. But maybe they were involved, they, they got up in the morning and they did some training. So, and then there's a team dynamics. So again, we're just talking here about the complexity of each of these things. So Steamboat is in Steamboat <laughs> and, and where you are. So that's the community and the league and the structure. So the structure of your competitive, competitive environment. So I don't know where you go to compete, uh, but those are all decisions. Again, if you have to travel very far to compete, uh, that affects, again, that affects the, the, the environment, that, that, that affects the experience. And then kids have complementary activities. They go to school, they, maybe they do music, uh, maybe they are involved in, uh, you know, they have social relationship, they have friends, they have. So all that, again, affects, it's gonna affect that practice on Tuesday afternoon. And then there's a social environment. Uh, so the social environment could be the, 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 the crowd, could be, uh, could be the parents. Uh, but, but it's a bit more distance than the parents. The parents would, but it's everything that that is affecting the athletes at, at a lower at, at a more proximate level of the relationship so again quite complex in terms of if we're looking at it that way uh, and then this is just another way of visualizing the setting in terms of the different layers the activities and the relationships and what i'm going to do next so so probably like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, is I'm just gonna go through each of these gears and I'm gonna now move from that very complex uh, figure that you see here, like all these layers that are affecting and I'm starting with the setting. I'm starting at, with the actual physical environment, but I'm gonna reduce this to a very simple message, one sentence. So, but that sentence, you're gonna to have to believe me because it comes from a many years of research. So 
when we think about the appropriate setting, and here, again, I just want to give you the research background. And it's not, you don't, maybe, uh, you don't have to remember anything here, but what, what, I, what I want to show you is the, the, the strength, a little bit of what I'm talking about in here. So when we're talking about the setting, there's a lot of research that has been done on the course, on, on, on the, how do you change the environment so that the kids are playing, they get good experience out of sport. So this is called competitive engineering. So we, when you have skiers, you, you know, and, and I'm taking here all, downhill alpine skiing, uh, there's probably some size of hills that, that they start, and they are, you know, I, I, do, I do ski. And so, so, so you're entering the, the physical environment so that the kids are successful, that they can experience success. You know, I put small sided game here when you think about sports like soccer or hockey. Uh, you, you reduce the number of players. You know, if you play uh, uh, six-year-old soccer, the field is not the same size. And it's, but again, you're adapting the environment. So that you, but the actual, the environment where the kids play. Then there's the club and organization, that's level two. So again, at the level of steamboat, how do you regroup your athletes together? How do you mix the age together? And that's very important. There's a lot of research on relative age effect in terms of how, at, you know, especially in team sport, like the older athletes seems to be more successful chronologically, but maybe it's just because they're bigger and they're more mature. But grouping athletes, I, I, again, is our decisions that we make at the level of the competitive setting that have very big uh, consequences. And then finally, the community and the league, and we, we call this the birthplace effect. And I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, but we, we did some research talking about where elite level athletes come from. Uh, and we did research in the US you know, with the NFL, the NBA, the baseball, ba uh, hockey, and then you'll, you'll see where, where they're coming from. Uh, but, but there's an effect there too, depending when you grow up, where, where you're born and the size of the city that you were born in and where you start doing sport as an influence on your engagement, your long-term engagement. So what can we say about level one, two, and three of that research? And, and that's the sentence here that I want to give you kind of the conclusion of all these stuff. And, and again, that is simplifying this quite a bit, but really when we talk about appropriate setting, we're talking about size, accessibility, and competitive structure. Influence athletes immediate experience and long-term outcomes. So the size of the field, but also the size of the city and also the size of the club. And, and it doesn't mean that bigger city cannot be successful, but I think we need to think very hard about how do we structure sport in bigger cities and the competitive structure that we're pro promoting. So again, where does that come from? So if I go a little bit more, go back to the research. So at the level of one and two, so at the level of the, 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 the field and at the level of the, the club, what we know is that the size matter, the size of the, the, and we can change equipment, and I'm sure that you do in skiing, and we can change the, the actual uh, field that you're playing on, but we can also change a competitive structure. How long do you travel to go to a race? And, and how important is that? Uh, do you keep race times? And do you have internal competition? And is that, and I'm not, I don't know if it, if you, you know, if you do, if you're not, but, but how is that helping or diminishing interest and the, the, and the development of confidence and the long-term participation? So again, research at that level, the research at the level of the, the level three of the level of the city. So I talked a little bit about this, but lots of research, mainly in, in team sport, that have looked that have shown that size of the city matter where athletes grow up where they start doing sport and proximity to a club also really matters so just to give you an and basically like the, the punchline here is that smaller cities cities of about 50,000 people there's a really large 
uh, very highly correlated with number of athletes that are playing in the NFL, in the NBA, in the NHL. Uh, so, but it's, it's, it's being born in those cities and being introduced to sport at, in those cities. And then the same thing we did it at a club level. So the smaller club seems to be, it seems to be easier to develop athletes. Uh, and, and, and it has a lot to do with accessibility, you know, being able. So, so the example I have here that I use very often is that if you play ice hockey in Toronto, uh, they're going to tell you at age five or six if you're good or not. But where I'm talking from tonight, Kingston, there's 100,000 100, people in Kingston. But if you play ice hockey in Kingston at six, they're going to take you because we don't have enough players. And then they, they're going to, everybody's going to play. But very quickly in a bigger city, they make those selections. And there's absolutely no reason, no evidence to make those selections at that age, because there's no correlation between early success and late success uh, in most sport in, in in all the sport basically except those sports where you reach peak performance at 15 or 16 years old so what the setting tells us uh, is that again this is something that is not from a coach perspective where we cannot all very often change these things but what it does affect is that it affects the social dynamics and it affects the type of activities we're going to do. Uh, so, you know, opportunity to play and practice, sampling, specialization, the relationship, and the social structure. So, basically, what I have here is that the appropriate setting, the variable of the physical and competitive environment at the level of the course, the club, and the community, so size, accessibility, competitive structure, will affect the activities, the relationship, and the social environment and will lead to, uh, will affect those long-term long -term outcomes. Again, I can stop here for a minute before I move to the next one. I think uh, any questions or comments? Hi, uh, I run all the youth programs at the Winter Sports Fund. My name is Blair Seymour and um, I was just curious a little bit about um, competitiveness at younger ages versus older ages and how much do you um, think that is appropriate? Yeah, great question. So I have, I have uh, you know, a few years ago in Canada, we uh, they stopped counting uh, score in soccer before age 10, I think, or 12. And I remember writing a, writing a, in a newspaper writing an opinion about it. And I, I, and I said, that's not the problem. The problem is coaches and, and what we do with winning and losing. And, and, I, and I, I, so, I, so I guess my answer here is sport is competitive. That's what makes sport fun. And kids, if they go on the streets and play, they will compete. But what do we do as adults with that results is what makes, what makes competition bad or make, can make competition bad. So I don't think there's nothing wrong with competition, but we should not be using the results of a race or the results you know, at seven or eight to determine the quality of an athlete. So it's just a fun thing to do. You win and you lose and you learn these things, but don't use that to say, you know, because of a two second race, uh, you know, do you finish, you finish first, uh, you go, you move to another level. I think we have to be very careful. We can certainly do that when with adults and with older adolescents, but with young kids, I think it's as very much a negative impact, but I would not remove it. Great. Uh, Dr. Thank Cote, this, this is, oh, sorry, Blair. All good. Um, Dr. This is uh, Dave. I, just a question. I, I, I was familiar with that research on the optimal city size for the highest level development, but not about the club size. Is that something you can talk a little bit more about? And what are those variables that made the smaller clubs more successful at athlete development versus larger clubs? There's not a lot of research, Dave. I think there's one in, uh, we, we, we did one in, um, in Norway. 
uh, and with soccer. So, so I'm saying that in a way that, and, and I'm basing it also with school. So there, there's research with high school, bigger high school, where the kids seems to be not as adapted or, but, but the, the thing here is that it's not the size. And, and I, you know, this is the problem with that kind of research because it's not the size. It's what, what do we look? So if you have a bigger club, but if it's structured in a way where kids feel that they belong, kids feel that they're, uh, you know, they, there is a culture and there is a relationships uh, there is role, there are role models, there's people, you know, everything that we find in smaller town or in smaller clubs that is more naturally happening, I think kind of get lost when we have more people, you know, it gets lost just because suddenly it, it, it's, it takes a long time to, to get to the club and you cannot to talk, you cannot talk to the coach and because the coach is busy with other people and so that's the, I think that would be my only comment on that. Not a lot of research to back up what I said, but it makes sense. And again, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I think so for us, we are quite a large club overall, but within that we have seven different sport disciplines. And then you break that down further on age groups. So if we have small groups there, these small teams of perhaps, uh, you know, 20 athletes, but it, then the coach to athlete ratio is exactly. uh is, is one to six we're, we're mitigating those factors maybe of having a big club is that something that some way that we can address it in terms of that maybe some of the negative aspects of size exactly yes because you know size is i think is related very closely with accessibility accessibility mm -hmm. to people you know talking to people like you know when it becomes that there's too many people and i cannot talk to yeah so when team makes sense yeah yeah. If there are 30 kids in your group, that's, that's a big, that's big, right? You know, with one coach exactly. versus, versus six to one. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more question about um, the rapid age effect that you just quickly mentioned, but I'm just curious a little bit to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of research on that, huh? like, like kind of too much. Uh, <laughs> Especially in team sport, uh, I don't know too much if they. I don't think it, it. I'm not sure if it really is an effect in in skiing or. Uh, but 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 basically, what it is is that you know if you if you're born like there's always a cutoff date like if you're gonna play ice hockey or soccer, no cutoff date could be January first. So if you're born on January second, then you're gonna be the youngest kid in that age group. And the, those kids that are born in those younger, in those, in that trimester, they have a disadvantage. So they could almost be like 12 months younger than the kids that's born at the end of December. But that kid's going to be bigger and more mature. So if it's ice hockey, just because they're bigger and they're more mature, there seems to be a disadvantage for the kids that are born at, at, at the beginning of the, of the registration period. What do you do with kids that are physically matured a little bit faster than the other ones? So I think I can tell you for team sport, I don't really know in your sport what you would do. Uh, you know, in team sport, it would mean to give opportunity to those kids as much and, and to try to, you know, just because the kid is huge and can get in front of the net in hockey and then, and then can, can be successful. So as a coach, you need to say, okay, wait a minute, the, the smaller kids that cannot do that, I need to give them tools to be able to do that and develop that. And not, not giving, providing too much advantage to those bigger kids, those more mature kids. And, and to realize that at some point, you know, at tw 12 years old, if you're bigger, very often the kids that is smaller at 12 will catch up at 14 or so, so making sure that you're able to perceive that as a coach or within a program to make sure that everybody's given a chance. Does that make sense? Yes, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thanks. It's just difficult to speak to a computer. <laughs> I don't really know. I don't see any reaction, but okay. No, and I think, and one thing with this, the, that relative aid effect is definitely present in our sport. There's no question about that. And it's a very interesting one where 
it presents itself up up through the youth age groups into college, but then it, it flips, I believe, at the elite level as it does in all of our sports. Where at the at the highest elite levels, it's actually the, the, those kids who are at the other end of the the, the age year who are most successful. Well, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and often, you know, we, it's those kids that don't get the attention early on. Maybe they, they just take it on themselves and they get really driven to, to improve and to, so, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I didn't know it, it was existing. And so that's in cross-country skiing? Or? I think uh, it's, yeah, in all, and I think it's, it's in skiing. I think uh, there's been some research in alpine ski racing that's, that's shown that the, the, okay. over, the representation at young age groups. And then, the, and then the, it's um, over-representation of kids born later in the year um, okay. who are you know, they've always been younger in the relative age spectrum at the very highest level. Okay. So, so I think from a club perspective, in terms of how you, you mix those kids together could be you know, something to think about uh, so that they interact, like the bigger kids or the more mature interact with the younger kids. So, but, yeah. Okay, I'll move on to the second component or the gear is activities. And here it's the idea of, the main idea here is play and practice. I think to me, like if you really want to, again, simplify this is, you know, I, I, you always have a choice when you have, I don't know how long your practice are in, in skiing, but you have a two or three hours practice, I don't know, an hour practice. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do in that practice? And, and I think it's always the idea of you have choices and, and what are you gonna do in the, with, the, with that time? Are you gonna, is it gonna be all drill? Is it gonna be all technical? Is it gonna be, are there gonna be any games? Is it gonna be, a lot, is there gonna be interaction with your athletes in terms of, are we gonna to try to create some fun? But that's, that's to me, so that's the activities. And there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of, uh, choices you can have in terms of designing those activities and and i think you know from a club perspective how many competitions a year do you do and all that kind of stuff so when you look at activities level one so that's the kind of the closest one it's the idea that i just talked about you know the idea of deliberate practice deliberate play the idea of nonlinear pedagogy uh so inclu and including some fun kind of games uh and sometimes that is not the most uh, optimal way to develop skill, but it's a very good way to develop interest. And, and I think that's always what you have to fight. You know, that's always the, that conflict you have. Is, am I gonna do a lot of deliberate practice? You know, if we had robots, uh, if we had people that, that uh, don't have any emotion, and, and don't, uh, you know, they don't feel anything, then, then probably the best thing to do is always skill and skill and skill and developing the technical. But, to, you know, athletes, are, they're motivated and they, they, they have interest. And I think this is where the idea of play comes in and fun. So that's the sport of interest. At the second level is, do you allow your athletes to do other sports? And, and how do you do this as a club? How do you do this as a coach? And uh, do you give them opportunity to ski for fun, you know, to go out and, 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 and go and ski and have fun without being evaluated or all the time? So this is the idea of early sampling and early specialization at that level. And then finally, the complementary activities, where there's not a lot of research here, but is the providing the opportunity for the athletes to be involved in other activities. Uh, so, and then you can take from a performance perspective, you know, how much time do you give athletes in terms of sleep and performance and, and uh, or, or eating and then, you know, all these things that are very important from an athlete's perspective, the rest. So, again, at all these level, so when you look at this, deliberate practice, deliberate play, early sampling, early specialization, other types of activities. What is the key word? What, what is the main thing here that is important? And one word is diversity. So at all of these level, when you think about what you do within a practice, diversify, do different things. Just don't do 
technical skill in one practice, but try to vary things. At the level of the sport, you know, you have a, a ski jumper, allow them to do something else, to do something else than just ski jumping or snowboarding or try to do other things. So that's diversity. And then and, and at the third level, making sure that the kid, that the athletes have time to do, uh, you know, if they want to learn music or, and they have time to socialize with their friends and they, so diversity again, if you just take this as a theme, as a, there's a lot of complexity to it. And we can, you know, and I, and I just want to show you this. I'm going to show it to you quickly because our time is going quick. Uh, but this is just a, a model of diversity within the first level. So when we think about play and practice, and you can think of sport as being led by adults or by youth, and your activity that you're designing, they could have a lot of extrinsic value or being a lot of fun. So that's long term, and that's very short term. So if you're going to do a lot of deliberate practice, you know, very technical learning skills, this is what we have to learn. Lots of feedback, consistent feedback all the time. That's important. But that's one type of things you can do. And then you can also get your athletes involved in deliberate play. Just let them, for half an hour, just do whatever you want to do. Have fun or create a game. And that's kind of the play practice. Create that game that's led by adults. And, and then you have athletes that suddenly they, can, they engage in spontaneous practice. They go by themselves without their coach and they go there and that they, they, they do their, uh, they try to improve their skill. So that's that basketball player that goes in the driveway and that shoot basketball. I don't know what it looks like in skiing, but it's, you know, it's that skier that just go by themselves and practice, practice their technique or practice their, their turn or whatever you need to practice. <coughs> so that's the within. Uh, and then the between, you know, so that's the idea of sampling versus early specialization. So why is it important to, to diversify within sport, uh, between sport, to allow athletes to do different sport? To me, sure, learning different skill, but one of the most important thing is experiencing different social settings. And you know, even within skiing, like ski jumping is probably very different from snowboarding and alpine skiing and the culture, the, the people, but, but allowing athletes to be able to experience that, to experience different, you know, playing tennis is quite different from playing basketball than doing cross-country skiing or doing snowboarding. So all that allows athletes to make choices and that's, that is, to me, that is the most important aspect of sampling. So the exploration of different sports. So I don't know if you are, uh, if anybody have seen this before. This is our developmental model of sport participation. And again, I don't want to, uh, but, you know, basically here, there's two different pathways to, you enter to sport from the bottom here, and you can have an early specialization and investment. And again, it could work, but that's very high amount of deliberate practice, technical, low deliberate play and involvement in one sport at a very young age. So what, so this is kind of, that's a pathway. And the other one is the sampling where you have high amount of deliberate play, low amount of deliberate practice. We don't focus too much on the technical. I'm talking about six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, involved in several sports. And then this facil fa facilitates situational interest when, that we talked about. You know, you trigger surprise and novelty. And so suddenly, oh, it's skiing, that's a lot of fun. I really like snowboarding, you know, but I try different things. So now I can make my choice. I say, I try these, all this, but snowboarding, it's really what I want to do because I love the coaches. I love the setting. I love the people. And I just love the sensation of doing that. But if you don't try anything else, it's hard to make that choice. And that choice comes from, needs to come from the kid, from the athlete. So from the sampling years, the research showed that people can go into the recreational years or they can specialize and invest. And all these pathways have shown to lead to elite performance, Olympic level athletes, continued engagement, 
to their participation and high level of personal development. Early specialization pathway, there's research that shows, yes, it leads to elite performance. And we all know Tiger Woods and the Williams sister. And so that, that works, but the cost is at the level of participation, enjoyment, and a lot more dropout. So, you know, if you remember, well, if, you, if we think that, that football in Texas, why is, this, is it working? It's working because in Texas, they play football and there's a lot of kids. So the system is working despite the bad coaches, the bad parents and the bad, you know, what, what's happened because there's so many kids. You know, it's, it's probably the same thing with ice hockey in Canada. We think we're really good at it and we have a good system, but everybody plays hockey. So, so suddenly there's so many kids. So, so when you look at these sports where there's very high involvement of kids, Sure, they can, have, they can do early specialization and it's gonna work because they don't really care about the dropout and they don't really care about the kids that don't continue. So again, here, the main message is that this sampling, tons and tons and tons of research show that you can accomplish the three Ps at the end. While here, sure, you can accomplish performance, but there's gonna be a cost. So just to, tell you that this work, again, we did some work with the NBA, and I've been doing some work recently with uh, medicine quite a bit too. And, and, and the medical profession is getting really, really uh, anxious about this. And, and they're doing a lot of research, they're engaging in the research, because now, you know, uh, surgeons are doing uh, surgery on kids, like at 12, 15 years old, that they used to see at, you know, they use the overuse injury that they used to see at on 20, 25 years old kids, uh, athletes. And, it, and it's just because of this idea of early specialization overuse. And so that's another reason why sampling should be promoted. Okay, last one I'm gonna, because I think I'm running a little bit over time here, uh, is the social dynamics. So unless there's very burning question, I'll just keep going or. Okay, social dynamics, again, three levels, the relationship, so one-on-one -on -one coaching, athlete-athletes, athletes-parent, coach-athletes, the quality of the social dynamics, at the second level, the team dynamics, and then at the other level, the social environment, and you can think about the social environment in Steamboat or the social that, that is, again, that's harder to control, and then as we get closer, it's easier to control with the relationship. So what do we know about this? Well, lots and lots and lots and lots of research. Uh, lots of research on coach-athlete relationship, parents-athlete relationship, autonomy supportive coaching. I'm going to talk about transformational coaching, parent support, lots of work. Uh, I have a colleague here at Queen's that does his main areas of research is on team dynamics, the level two here. Cohesion, motivational climate, teamwork, social identity. And then a little bit less research, but on the, the higher, the level three, the social environment. Uh, so this is a very, very big leap that I'm doing here. So I'm taking all that research and, but what is important in the social dynamics? And I put it in one sentence. What is important in the social dynamics? All these bodies of research, these lines of research show that a social dynamics, so athlete relationship, parents relationship, should help athletes feel that they are important and what they do is important. So again, that's a very, very simple way to talk about a body of evidence and the line of research that goes on for 50 years and, and tons and tons of research. But that, at the end of the day, that's what is important. As a coach, you want to make your athletes feel that they are important and what they're doing as meaning is meaningful. So if you do that as a coach, then you, 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 you're, you're taking care of that social dynamics. So the way we, and, and next week, I'm gonna do a, a workshop uh, with, with Dave, and I think maybe some of you will be there uh, on transformational leadership and transformational coaching. And that is a way of understanding that level one, that coach-athlete, parents-athlete relationship. 
And the way to understand this and uh, is, is think about leadership as being effective or less effective and as the coach or as the leader to be engaged or less engaged. And if you're not, if you're engaged and not effect, ineffective, you're toxic. And if you're not engaged and you're ineffective, you're less effective. So, so in your in your training, you're you're checking your email or your Facebook or you're doing something else. And then you have coaches that are neutral, you know, and you have some of these coaches or or, or you know that just go here and do that, and that's what we're going to do today. Tone of voice, you know, the same, and no excitement, no emotions. And, and again, it's right on the right on. I don't know if we don't know too much about it. It could be effective sometime. And then there's a transactional style. I'll talk about it next week quite a bit. But everything is a transaction. You, you're going to do this, and I'm you know. So you use punishment and reinforcement to re, to to help athletes do something. And you can see here that it could be effective, but it could also be ineffective. In the long term, it is ineffective. And then you have this style of leadership that is transformational, which is very effective and we are engaged. And what is transformational leadership? Well, <coughs> the four I of transformational leadership is, the first one is idealized influence. And this is very powerful theory that has been studied in business, medicine, uh education sport but basically those four style of uh, those four i of it gives you a style of, of of interacting with people and the first one so idealize influence is practice what you preach as a coach be a role model if you ask your athletes to do something also do it you know you are, so again we'll talk about this quite a bit next week inspirational motivation what do you do so believe in your athletes. So this is where goal setting, mission statement, uh, adding objectives. Uh, so that's what motivates athletes. And we'll talk about ways of doing this. But at the end of the day is believing in your athletes, expressing your confidence, expressing, telling them that they're good and, and, and doing that. So that's inspirational motivation. Intellectual stimulation is involving athletes in the coaching process, engaging athletes, providing meaning to a training to an exercise, to something, so, so that they know what's going on. And, and athletes are, you know, they, they have a head, they can get involved, asking questions, why, why did you do this? Why, why, why should we do that today? Providing choices. And then the last one is individualized consideration, the idea of a person-centered approach. And, and you, you notice here that it's not athlete-centered, it's person-centered. And there's a reason for this because athlete centered is still about athletes. Person centered, it's about the person. And that's what individualized consideration is. You're going to have an athlete that's going to come to a training. Uh, and then again, they finish an exam or they, they, they broke up with their boyfriend. Uh, you know, knowing that is important. And, and, and you know, you may not want to, they may not want to talk about it, but at least getting a sense of their life and where they're coming from is, is and that's the idea of individualized consideration. So that's transformational leadership. And Jennifer Turnage in our lab, uh, she was a doctoral student. And for two years, we observed coaches. We went to practices during games. We put microphone on, on, on uh, coaches. And we had a big parabolic uh, microphone where we were recording coach athlete interaction. And basically what we found, or what Jennifer found, is 11 behaviors that are really closer to coaching, that when those behaviors are, are displayed more often, there seems to be a, an increase in competence, confidence, connection, and character. And what these behaviors are, they're the 11 behaviors here, I'm not going to talk about them tonight, but they fit within, it, within the four I of transformational leadership. So for example, idealized influence in coaching is discussing and modeling pro-social values or behaviors. So talking to your athletes about what do you do when you lose? What do you do when you win? And, and displaying those behaviors towards your opponent. On, so that's idealized. And then the other one is showing vulnerability and humility as a coach. 
So you make an error as a coach. Do you apologize or do you start yelling because your athletes missed something or they, they didn't do something you told them? Or do you try to understand? But I think this goes a long way in creating trust and tr creating trusting environment. Being able to acknowledge when, okay, this was not the perfect practice. This was not the perfect drill. And I know where you're coming from. And that's, and then suddenly you'd open a conversation. So again, what transformational coaching is that displaying those behaviors through and through the workshop next week, we're going to talk about these and we're going to get coaches to really talk about a plan to come up with those behaviors, to show those behaviors more often. Uh, and then what we've been able to show is that when coaches are displaying those behaviors, there is an increase in the personal assets, then there's an increase in the positive experiences of the athletes. So we have a system that allows us to measure those behaviors, the leadership behaviors. And this has not been done before because everything that is usually observed in coaches are the professional behaviors, the, you know, the, the, the feedback and the instruction. And, but this is the how of coaching. So, so the, the, you know, giving feedback and giving instruction is very important. That's the what, that's, our, that's the actual content. But how do you deliver instruction? So that's, that's the leadership tone behaviors. And those are the, again, you can be transformational, transactional, neutral, this effect of toxic. So that's the research. So that's the three gears. And I want to finish here about three minutes. What this shows is that you can intervene at one level. And, you know, for example, you can do the transformational leadership workshop. So basically the transformational leadership workshop is to improve the relationship between coach and athletes. If you improve the relationship between coach and athletes, it's gonna have an effect on the team dynamics. And then it's probably gonna have an effect on engagement in the activities. And it could also have an effect on the playing, on, on, the, on, the, on, on the actual training uh, site. Or you can, you can change the structure of the training more in here. And again, it will. So, so the, the whole idea is all, all these things are integrated and they, they all interact with each other. So as an organization, you want to find, okay, where, what do I change? If I change the ratio, the number of athletes to coaches, well, it could affect relationship. It could affect how they engage in the training. And, and all these things, again, they, there's nothing hard I can tell you about this is the perfect way to do it, but they, 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 we need to try to see how these things interact together in, and are integrated in a sporting environment. So the gears are working together. So I had to put a picture of Ken Moore and the Canadian, Canadian my, my Canadian uh, uh, side. Uh, but but the, I, I guess to conclude all this, this is the model I started with, the personal assets framework. And I think the messages that I really want to emphasize is the idea that when you think about outcomes in athletes, we need to think about long-term, but also short-term and very short-term, the, the, the immediate experience of those athletes. And, and, and again, if you don't have the immediate positive sport experience, this is not, not gonna happen. So, um, so when you think about it that way, the immediate is a development of situational and individual interest, fun, uh, enjoyment, uh, practice and training that looks like that. The short-term development are the idea of the four Cs. So develop confidence, competence, connection, and character. And again, when you're starting to think about it, like maybe they just, you know, you look at this and say, oh, that's the four C, but you think about the outcomes that you achieve as, as a coach, and we'll do it next week in the, in, the, in the workshop. Everything could kind of fit within those big, big categories of, of short-term outcomes. And then finally, the three Ps are your long-term outcomes, uh, personal development, participation, and performance. So, um, and then the dynamic elements. And again, it's a little bit, you know, if I, if you, I don't know if there's any researchers in the group, but some, some of, some researcher could be a bit 
uh, iffy if you look at this, but I think it's important to, to simplify things. And you know, I've worked with organizations where we only work on this. They just take this principle of diversity within their within the organization, and then there's tons of stuff you can do with that. You know, diversity at the level of a practice, diversity at the level of the kids, you know, gender, uh, age, diversity happens, you know, like so, so so I think <clears throat> sometimes when we think about models of coaching, we overstructure coaching. And, and I think to me, those principle of appropriate setting, engagement and activity, quality social dynamics, if we just use those and what we know from the research as the basis of good sport program, then we can be very creative in terms of how we design those uh, elements for our coaches or, or how do we design training for coaches. So I think I'm done, yeah. Went a little bit over, but not too much. Well, thank you, Dr. Cote. That was that was excellent. Very interesting. Um, one thing I find really interesting is this idea of um, helping athletes feel that they're important. I know we have a number of parents on the call here. I feel like that's something that um, a role that parents can play. Um, you know, the, in, in this process is um, showing that interest and that the, the role that sport plays in their overall development um, relative to, the, it's not so much focus on results or performance, yeah. but just uh, that what they're doing, that, that their practice, that their involvement or their participation is very important. Yeah. You know, it's interesting if, if, if I think about the, the birthplace and showing that the small city kind of develop higher level of, 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 of elite level athletes, and you can relate it to this idea of importance. I, I think in a small town, even if you're not that good, you're gonna to be told you're good because there's not a lot of kids to compare yourself with. You know, there's a lot less kids to compare yourself with. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're uh, ice hockey players in Toronto, there's so many kids to, you know, in a natural way. So, so I think, so I guess the point here, it, it, is that it's important to tell the kids that they, they are doing well. Even if, you know, if, even if there's a better kids, they're trying, you know, they're, they're, and then they're improving. And if you see that, if you notice that, it's important to tell them, even if there's a better kid than them. Because I think that really, really get the kids going. You know, this, there's people believing in me. And, and, and I think, again, it's this environment that we're creating to make sure that that is expressed and that this that the kids are know that. Any any questions or any comments? <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you. We appreciated it. Thank you. Hello. What are you doing? Is he a skier or? Hey. Luke, you a skier? Tonight he played soccer, so there's some diversity. Oh, okay. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He'll be in the UA. Yeah. Group. Mm -hmm. And then we have a U10 who's playing piano right now, so he's getting some more diversity. <laughs> Wait, where am I? Are you what? You're you eight. Out from some of our coaches. I know we have some very experienced coaches on this call. I'd be curious um, some of your thoughts are on this. And we've heard from Blair already, but Maddie and Ben. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for the invitation. I, I had one question um, about grouping. What, were you referring to just the size of the group or were you referring to the ability of the group as well? I, I was referring to the ability also, yes. Could you expand on that? Are there, are there, is there a study, uh, study around um, higher levels being paired together and, and not mixing different abilities? Yes. Uh, So the study that I can tell you about are more at a younger age, 
where ability where, where different abilities together seems to create better uh well better cohesion uh, seems to better engagement over time uh, and, and i think that the, the one thing that the one study that i'm thinking is a very small town in nova scotia like eastern canada that we we look where they, they produce a lot of basketball players at the university level soccer players but you every time that you know the, the town was so small that the athletes were all different ages and all different abilities playing together and 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 interacting together and you can see that there's always something good for even the less skilled players that are kind of modeling the high skilled player and then even teaching and then when they're teaching the the lower skilled players then they kind of learn something also and uh, and then the, the the less skilled players they want to be like the better skilled player so so i think there's a very there is a, a skill issues but there's a there's a psychological and social environment that that it creates where it could be very healthy uh, but i don't know how it could be I, i'm not aware of any study that have really uh, did it in a very controlled way, uh, you know, where you you, you try to mix uh, different levels. I, I, I don't know if. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, you mentioned it earlier. We have athletes that are, you know, trying to make the Olympics and athletes that are more participatory and um, we're trying to meet the needs of everybody. So um, we often mix groups and everything. And it seems like that's maybe not a bad thing. I think it would be a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. No, I'm talking a lot here, but you know, one thing we're we're gonna I hear from uh, Mark Williams tomorrow, uh, Dr. Cody, which he talks a lot about some of these things as well. So it's a good uh, good connection to this and this uh, balance okay. between developing skill. And developing motivation is, I know, something that he's that he's talked about. And that is that deliberate practice, ten thousand hours versus um, the value of of play and developing that intrinsic motivation. Is yeah. that something you could? I know there's a lot of research on that, but I think it's something that's very interesting for parents and for coaches. Is that something you could talk about a little bit as well? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, well, you know, it, it's interesting to talk about Mark Williams because I think Mark a lot of the earlier studies that he did he was really a proponent of deliberate practice but he comes from a very different uh, perspective than i do like i come more from a psychology perspective he comes more from a skill acquisition perspective but it's interesting that we meet you know at you know like at some point we we kind of agree on many things uh but yeah to to me the kids get involved in sport because it's fun and, and, and I think many sport, it's, you know, it's just the joy and the enjoyment and, and then adults get in the way sometime and then they're starting to structure and, and starting to, and it becomes way too serious too early. So, so I think to me, the model of interest that I showed is really key in terms of developing motivation, you know, knowing where your athletes are on that interest scale and, and, and good coaches will be able to notice that, that, you know, they're coming like one week and their head is down and they're, they're not smiling. They're not that. So what can you do to kind of re-trigger that, that interest and that enjoyment of, of the sport? And sometimes it mean, it may means that you get a little bit behind in skill and that you get a bit behind, but that's, to me, that's worth it. You know, it's it, because if you have a motivated driven athlete, uh, they're gonna, they're gonna catch up. They're gonna, they're, they're gonna, yeah. So yeah, it's it, it's a bit, it's it, but it's not an easy thing. There's not a recipe, <laughs> but it's again knowing your athletes and 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 talking, you know, talking to them. Where are they? You know, how do they feel? How do they feel about a training and and and, and after training or and, and involving them in the process to make those decisions too. And sometimes it's just giving them the perception that they have choices. <laughs> you know, kids are like that. It's, uh, 
And it seems like it's something that would change with age group to as, as your model suggests to at the younger age group to have it be much more about motivation and developing that. But then by the time you get to 16 years old, the, the, all these, uh, most of those athletes have developed that motivation at a young age and are ready for more focused skill development and uh, sessions that are much more focused on, um, on, st on much more structured um, training. Yes. But I think at that level, at a higher level, you need a, you know, you need a challenging coach, but you need a, you need a caring coach and you need, because they have other things in their life. Huh? There, there's a lot going on, uh, you know, school and relationships and, you know, money and jobs. And so, so there's lots. Uh, so I think those behaviors or those transformational leadership behaviors are still there, but that they're at another level. Uh, it's not necessarily the motivation, but to keep that balance and to keep them uh, healthy, mentally healthy. There's a lot of research now on mental health and athletes. And, <coughs> and I think more and more, are, excuse me, more and more athletes are kind of uh, talking about those issues. I think what happened at the Olympic with Simon Biles and you're probably not too big of a hockey uh, hockey fan, but uh, today Carey Price, the goaltender of the Montreal Canadian, is taking a month off. Decided uh, because of mental health. So you know he's making ten millions a year, <laughs> but I think you know I think it's good. It's probably very good because what used to happen, I think, with those athletes before is that they get into drugs and alcohol, and so being able to recognize those issues and address them uh, and providing the support is, I think that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> They're human being. Hey, uh, this is Tony Levy, I'm a free skiing coach. Um, I have a question just on that research. Is there any research yet about how athletes depart sport when you talk about um someone who came from a, a diverse background versus that early specialization and what they turn into as humans as the sport leave as they leave sport or their sport so i if i understand your question well so an athletes that have experience that have sample and leave sport leave sport retired and at least that an early specializer that retired yeah, like how does what happens to the human af yeah, after they're done with whatever level of you know competitive sport they they reach? Yeah. I, I think the research would show that uh, it's a lot harder to adapt back to life if you had a dear, that early specialization pathway. And the main reason is that your identity is sport, you know. But but I I'm saying this, but I think any Olympic level athletes would have a hard time going through that transition. But it, you know, because any Olympic athletes, that is their identity. Uh, you know, this is what they do and this is who they are. That's, uh, that's you know, they're, they're a skier. They're, and that's what they've done for, you know, 15 years or 12 years of their life nonstop. Uh, but I think the, the, the people that have had a chance to sample and that 